Well, let's go to El Paso, Texas now. We're hearing from witnesses of that shopping center shooting yesterday. Many say they were out with their families when they were told to flee for their lives. The first thing I, I heard was the gunshots. And then when I turned around and to see what was going on, that's when I saw him and that's when I ran back with my mom and I told her, let's go, let's go, let's go. Run out that way. They told us to go in the back of the room and uh, next thing you know it, they were saying that there was an active shooter. I've never been in this situation before. I see a whole bunch of kids just running around, you know, without their parents and stuff. So I got my bag in my hand. I'm trying to pick them up one by as many as I can just run out. But they're so, like, you know, anxious, they're, like, jumping out of my hands. I just hope some kids are right? That's all I'm thinking about right now is the kids. I'm not even worried about myself right now. This is something that's never occurred in my 22 years of being a police officer in El Paso. Reporter Steve Futterman is on the ground in El Paso, Texas, with more details for us this morning. Uh, Steve, dawn is starting to break there. What's the latest where yeah. you are? Well, the, this investigation has been going on throughout the night. Behind me, you can see maybe the uh, blue Walmart sign. And uh, detectives have been inside, investigators have been inside the Walmart throughout the night, going through this meticulous investigation, trying to recreate what took place. Now, our last briefing, which was around midnight last night, we were told that most, if not all, of the, the victims, the bodies, were still inside the Walmart. That may have changed overnight. We've not gotten any update. We will get an update in a few hours. but. This is going to be a very meticulous examination. They want to know where everyone was shot. They want to know where the fatalities took place. They need to mark these things down. They are going to take their time. This area is going to be cordoned off, I would suspect, for at least several days while this investigation goes on. The suspect alive in police custody and, as we understand, cooperating. Yep. Steve, what do we know about the investigation as it moves forward? Well, cooperating to some degree, we've not gotten details about that. Has he confessed? Is he giving them all details? Or is he basically just uh, answering some basic questions? We may learn more about that later today. Now, he did surrender relatively peacefully. He did not engage in a shootout with police. He's 21 years old. And obviously, authorities are looking at what they call this mem uh, uh, this memorandum, this manifesto that he may have written or he certainly did post online. In it, there are very many complaints. It's a racist manifesto. It talks about the complaints about Hispanics coming into the U.S., especially into Texas in large numbers. And that may explain why this took place here. He lived in the Dallas area. That's several hundred kilometers away from here. But he came down here perhaps because he wanted his victims to more likely be Hispanics than non-Hispanics, this area right on the U.S.-Mexican border. And so as the forensics investigation, the coroner continues the investigation inside that mall, what do we know about the victims, Steve? Well, we know at least three of them were Mexican nationals. That came from Mexico's president yesterday. We were told at some point that there may have been a child who was among the victims. We don't have that confirmed yet, but we have heard today about a woman, a 25-year-old woman who may have died trying to save the life of her two-month-old child. According to authorities, she dove on top of the child as the gunshots were being fired. The child did survive, although may have suffered some broken bones. She was killed. Her husband, who was also inside the Walmart, has not been heard from, so it's very possible he may have been killed as well. But we've certainly heard about one woman who is a hero in all this, very likely saving the life of her two-month-old child. And so many of those stories that we are likely to hear of uh, under those tragic yeah. circumstances in the coming days. Steve Futterman, thank you so much once again for your time. Thank you, John. Freelance reporter Steve Futterman reporting from El Paso, Texas. U.S. President Donald Trump took to Twitter last night to condemn the shooting in El Paso, saying, quote, what happened is not only a tragedy, but an act of cowardice. I stand with everyone in this country to condemn today's hateful act and that there are no reasons or excuses that will ever justify killing innocent people. Well, to get her take on this, we're joined by Stephanie Carvin. Now, she's a former national security analyst and an assistant professor at Carleton's University's Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, and we reached her in Oshawa, Ontario. Stephanie, thanks so much for your time. Early on a weekend, two shootings within 13 hours, three in a week, if you count the uh, Garlic Festival shooting. What stands out for you when you look at them uh, unfolding like this as they are in the United States? At this time, it's too early to say what has happened in Ohio, although events there are definitely 
disturbing. What concerns me is that the two other shootings, as you said, the, the garlic festival shooting, as well as the one in El Paso yesterday, do have links to uh, white nationalism, white supremacy ideas. And this is uh, disturbing, particularly in the case of the El Paso uh, shooting. He seems to have left a manifesto, and we should, of course, be very careful with attrib attributing that to him at this stage. But there are signs it was his, and if it's the case, he has framed his actions in the, uh, using the Christchurch massacre earlier this year, where, of course, there was a massacre against Muslims at a mosque in New Zealand. So what's concerning here is that, you know, these individuals are, are not, you know, it's bad enough if these were just lone shooters, but this seems to be going beyond that. These seem to be individuals who are linking their actions to a particular political cause, uh, making these domestic terrorist acts. So when we talk about, as you say, whether he wrote that manifesto or even simply endorsing it, it seems to have uh, been something that may have inspired him in some way. So when investigators look at this, when they go through, uh, sort of down that rabbit hole, if you will, what sort of information can they hope to garner from that? I think what they're looking for in the case, you know, I, I'm not an expert so much in the U.S. law as I am the Canadian law, but with the Canadian law, what you'd be looking for is to see if an ideology was politically, religiously, or ideologically motivated. Motivated. And so I think, you know, something like a manifesto like this would, would definitely demonstrate this in the case of Canada. In the case of the United States, it, it's harder to say. At first, they were talking about it in terms of hate crime. Now we seem to be hearing the language of domestic terrorism. So that's important. So I think from a, a law enforcement perspective, I, I'm not familiar particularly with what the police in the United States would do. But any intelligence analyst would be looking to see if this individual, you know, how was this individual radicalized? How did he come to to hold these beliefs and more disturbingly would is this who is this individual been in contact with and has he been trying to radicalize others i think these are very important questions while incidents like this may help to focus the fbi and other authorities investigation much has been made of the fact that at a time was a time when the u.s authorities we think back to the 1960s and the ku klux klan murders in uh, the southern united states uh, the oklahoma city bombing etc and then after 9 11 how the investigations into white supremacist domestic terrorism sort of withered and died in the united states and the uh, uh, approach towards uh, uh, potential muslim terrorism took over from that uh, is this something that authorities may turn to focus on yet again in view of these incidents? I believe that's correct. And we saw evidence of that this week where it was revealed that the FBI is now considering uh, conspiracy driven uh, domestic terrorism as a major threat to the United States. So there seems to be a recognition now that, you know, it's terrorism doesn't come from one source. And in fact, it's never come from one source. There's been uh, multiple types of movements. And I think what we're seeing now is recognition, uh, particularly in the light of, of the Christchurch shooting, but also, you know, there's been um, at least five or six different incidents of kind of conspiracy driven white nationalist identitarian movements in the United States in recent years, far more in recent years than Islamic State or Al Qaeda inspired extremism. And that just to focus on one kind of extremism is probably wrong. So we're definitely seeing a shift and resources, and certainly we're seeing that here in Canada as well. Uh, earlier this year, testifying before the Senate, CSIS Director David Vignon uh, said that he felt that, you know, the service was increasingly having to look at these movements as well as domestic terrorism threats. So this isn't just an American phenomenon. We've seen it across uh, the UK, the US, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the Five Eyes Partners, and I believe it's very much on their radar. Stephanie, you just have a few seconds left, but I, I can't let you go without getting you to comment on the, uh, the use and the proliferation of these sorts of movements because of the internet. Could you briefly comment on that? Uh, briefly, you know, the internet is one of many factors that you would look at. The internet, you know, doesn't alone radicalize people, but certainly the concern is that these individuals can, um, you know, enter into these echo chambers get egged on. We call that polarization over time. And that's the concern that you really have. Um, in this particular case, what seems to be happening is that, you know, there's been the gamification of uh, domestic terrorism in the sense that these individuals are, are thinking about these mass shootings as, as uh, points killing, you know, wanting to beat the high, the quote unquote high score of Christchurch. This is what individuals on the internet are talking about. And I think this is what is definitely concerning about the style of attack uh, going forward. 
It's an awful scenario you point, Stephanie. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Stephanie Carvin is a former national security analyst, and she joined us from Oshawa, Ontario.